morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come and speak. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that I was scheduled after Matt, uh, because that means that the audience got a nap and is now well rested uh, and is ready to learn about deductions. I'm also glad that you've scheduled this conference downtown. Um, it was nice not having to drive up to Carmel or some other godforsaken part of the state. Um, so it was a nice leisurely walk over here this morning, so I, I hope this is your new home. Now, this is my third year presenting on this topic, and I'm sure for many of you it feels more like my 30th year. Uh, I feel the same way sometimes. But I do have a lot of material to get through today, and a lot of it is new. I'm going to do my best to get through it as quickly as I can. If I spill into the lunch hour a little bit, I will not be offended if any of you get up and leave. I would do the same thing. Um, but if you can tough it out to the bitter end, that would be great. Um, starting at, at the very beginning here, very rudimentary introduction here to the topic. I know there are a lot of new auditors out there and a lot of new staff out there. Uh, but what is, what is a deduction, um, and, and how does that differ from a, an exemption or a credit? And these, these terms mean different things. They operate differently. And basically, a deduction reduces the amount of assessed value subject to taxation. An exemption will exclude property from taxation, and in some cases, even assessment. A credit is applied to a tax bill once the bill has been calculated. Now, of course, I have to have a lawyerly disclaimer in my presentations that I feel important and like I'm doing my job. So this presentation and other presentations the DLGF gives and materials that we publish and distribute are not the law unto themselves, nor are they substitutes for the law. They're simply meant to be helpful uh, or informative and to, to give you some uh, useful tools or, or education. And at the end of the day, the Indiana Code always governs. So to the extent there's ever any conflict between a presentation or a publication of ours and Indiana Code, of course, the code is what governs. And always, if you ever have any doubt or question about uh, something, feel free to reach out to us, and we'll do our best to help you. And if we can't help you, we'll try to direct you to someone who can. Uh, don't rely on third-party rumors or gossip or anything like that. Um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to us. Sometimes auditors' offices will tell me, oh, I, I feel bad bothering you all the time, or I keep emailing you. I'd rather have somebody email me or call me up front and try to get clarification instead of just kind of guessing at it and then contacting me after the fact. Um, and don't, don't forget also to make use of your county attorney as a possible resource. Uh, that person might be able to help you. Uh, we don't deal with every aspect of local government law or issues, so there might be some things that your county attorney can help you with that we can't. Now this particular slide shows you how a deduction works. We start out with our gross assessed value of $90,000 in this example. Um, under the Indiana Code, the homestead deduction is always applied first, and then the supplemental homestead deduction is applied next. In terms of, of the order in which other deductions are applied, statute doesn't really address that. We recommend that the disabled vet deduction be applied last, because if there's an unused portion of that deduction remaining, the vet can apply that toward his excise taxes. Uh, so those, those are the taxes he pays on his vehicle at the BMV, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So as you can see here, we have, um, we've applied some deductions. We have our net assessed value, and that is the, the amount to which the tax rate is applied. Now, um, it is possible for deductions to zero out a tax bill. Uh, so I don't know if there's any myth or urban legend out there that uh, deductions can't zero out a bill. They can, and, and in many cases, they do. Uh, and the, the only exception to that is, is in the case of personal property mobile homes, and we'll talk about those a little later as well. Uh, but for personal property mobile homes, the assessed value of the mobile home can't be reduced by more than 50 percent, although the supplemental homestead deduction is not bound by that 50 percent cap. And then for all deductions, this is a, a pretty universal truth. The application has to be filled out and signed by December 31st, and then the application has to be filed or postmarked with the auditor by the following January 5th. Now, the next segment of the presentation here, I, I talk a little bit about uh, the, the most common deductions and try to give you a very basic nuts and bolts overview of, of the deductions and how they work. The homestead deduction, of course, is the most basic, most common and this deduction equals the lesser $45,000, or 60% of the gross assessed value of the property. And this applies to the dwelling uh, and the surrounding acre, even if that acre straddles multiple parcels. So if you have a dwelling on parcel A 
and there's a contiguous parcel B, and both fall within that acre, then both would receive the deduction in the 1% cap. Uh, the, the statute speaks in terms of the acre. It does not speak in terms of parcels. Now, this third bullet point here, the deduction applies to property that is the applicant's principal place of residence, meaning the individual's true, fixed, permanent home to which the individual has the intention of returning after an absence. Now, this is, that particular language is actually coming from the Indiana Administrative Code, which has the same force of law as the Indiana Code. Uh, but what, what exactly does that mean? I think this was written to contemplate situations where someone is deployed in the military or somebody's away on business and they're away from the homestead for a while. They can continue to claim the homestead so long as they have the intention of returning after the absence and the property is maintained as their homestead, basically meaning that it's not rented out. Now, this, this is going to be a very fact-sensitive case-by-case analysis, and I get questions all the time about, you know, what happens, you know, this person's been renovating a house for, for four years, or this person's in the nursing home for, for five years. At what point do we pull the deduction? And there's, I don't think there's any good cookie-cutter, universal, definitive answer to that. I think it's a case-by-case -case, uh, question. Somebody could go to the nursing home to recover from an injury or from surgery and be there for a couple of years theoretically but still have the intention of returning and they may in fact return after that absence so it's difficult to nail down exactly you know is there a magic number or period of time and I would say no if I were an auditor I'd probably have to reach out to the taxpayer and try to get a sense for uh, you know what you know what their intentions are what their plans are and then make a good faith decision based on, on the facts now, the applicant must own or be buying the property under a recorded contract that provides that the buyer is responsible for the taxes. And this is a pretty universal principle for all deductions. If you're buying the property under contract, the contract has to be recorded and provide that you as the buyer are responsible for the taxes. After you apply the standard homestead deduction, there's the supplemental homestead deduction. Uh, this again is applied to the net assessed value after, after the standard homestead has been applied. And this deduction equals 35% of the net AV below 600,000 and then 25% of any net AV greater than 600,000. The energy deductions, there are a few of these. There's the solar energy heating or cooling system and this deduction equals the out-of-pocket expenditures for the components and labor. And then there are some device deductions, solar power device, wind power, hydroelectric, geothermal. Now, uh, this deduction equals the assessed value of the property with the device, less the assessed value of the property without the device. Now, uh, something to keep in mind about this, I, I think that the, this particular deduction was intended to, to give the taxpayer basically a wash. You know, if, if you add the device and your assessed value goes up by $10,000, you'd get a $10,000 deduction basically. The problem is that this deduction, I think, predates the advent of the tax caps. And so when someone adds this device and their assessed value goes up by $10,000, their tax cap is probably going to go up a little bit. And so theoretically, they might end up paying more in taxes, even though the deduction was intended to, to give them a wash. I, I think that this is just an inherent flaw in the way the, the deduction interplays with the tax cap. I think there was legislation last year introduced that would have tried to fix that, but it didn't gain traction. Um, so it is something that taxpayers should keep in mind, but it is just an inherent flaw in the system. Now, the hydroelectric and geothermal devices do have to be certified by the Department of Environmental Management, but once they're certified, they don't have to be recertified, even if the property changes hands. All right, now the mortgage deduction. Uh, this deduction is the lesser of $3,000, the balance of the mortgage or contract indebtedness on the assessment date, or one half of the total assessed value of the property. Now, um, I don't know if there's any myth out there that uh, the mortgage balance has to be at least $3,000 on the assessment date. That's not true. Uh, there, there does have to be an indebtedness on the assessment date. But let's say you have a mortgage balance of $1,000 on the assessment date, then your deduction amount would be $1,000 because that's the least of these three amounts. Now, a person can't have more than one mortgage deduction in his name, but if you have, let's say, husband and wife, and they own a couple properties, and each property has a mortgage on it, uh, the husband could claim a, a full mortgage deduction in his name on one property, and the wife could claim a full mortgage deduction in her name on the other property. That would be, that would be acceptable. Or if, let's say, I own a business, an LLC, and I own a house in, in my name, I could claim a full mortgage deduction in my name on that house, and let's say the LLC owns a property in its name that has a mortgage on it, the LLC could claim a, a full mortgage deduction in its name uh, on that property. Yes? Let's see. Our, 
Oh, okay. Okay. Hopefully that's just accidental and not intentional, but let's see, is it, should I just, should I continue or, okay. All right, um, all right, I think I covered everything on mortgage deduction, at least on that slide. Um, now, this, the second bullet point here, I do get questions every now and then about uh, reverse mortgages or home equity line of credit, and the statute does permit the deduction where someone has a home equity line of credit, or I think that's probably another way of saying reverse mortgage. Now, the over 65 deduction, this is, this is definitely um, an advanced uh, learning deduction. This is, a, this is a tough one to work through. Um, this deduction equals the lesser of one half of the gross assessed value of the property, or $12,480. And yes, this deduction, like other deductions, can theoretically zero out a bill. Now, the applicant must have owned or been buying the property for at least one year before claiming the deduction. Now, this is a good example of where a statute gives us lemons and we have to make lemonade. What does the term claim mean? Now, I think in the past our agency has advised that ideally the person has owned the property for at least a year before applying for the deduction. But I think because there's some ambiguity in the statute here, I think it would be acceptable if someone were to come in and apply for the deduction in, let's say, in February of 2014. They just bought the property. They apply in February of 14. Because a year will have passed by the time the deduction shows up on the 14 pay 15 bill, I think that that would be acceptable. I think that that could count as the year. And again, it's because statute is a bit ambiguous on what claiming means. Now, the third bullet point here, applicant and a joint tenants or tenants in common must reside on the property. So let's say you have Bob and Sue, and they're a married couple. They're the only two who own the property, and they both reside. Or let's say Sue resides on the property, but Bob is in a nursing home. I don't think that would be a problem, because Bob and Sue are a married couple, and normally a married couple is, is a, I think, is a tenants by the entirety arrangement. But let's say Bob and, and his son own the property, um, and, and, Bob, and they own the property as tenants in common. Bob resides on the property, but his son does not. That, I think, would be a problem. I think that, again, the, any joint tenant or tenant in common would have to reside on the property with the, with the applicant. The combined adjusted gross income of the applicant and the applicant's spouse or applicant and any joint tenant or tenant in common for the preceding year did not exceed $25,000. And again, you know, let's say you have uh, Bob and Sue. They're a married couple. And let's say uh, they, live, they live apart, they live separately. I think you would still have to look at the income of both Bob and Sue because they are married. If Bob and Sue uh, own a property and they also own it with, with a, a child, with maybe their daughter, and she owns it as a tenant in common with her parents, I think you would have to look at uh, the income of both parents and the daughter in that situation. Also, the assessed value of the property cannot exceed $182,430. Now, the applicant must be at least 65 by December 31st of the year, preceding the year in which the deduction is claimed. There's that word claimed again. What we have advised in the past is that if somebody is applying for this deduction for, say, 15 pay 16, they have to be at least 65 by the end of 2015. Second bullet point here, very important. The same person cannot have the over 65 deduction in conjunction with deductions other than the homestead, mortgage, and believe it or not, the fertilizer storage deduction. Um, now, this is, this is coming from statute, and why there's this restriction, I really don't know, but it, it is there. But again, it's this, it, the restriction is on the same person. So let's say you have, let's bring back Bob and Sue. Um, let's say Sue applies for the over 65 deduction. Bob could apply for the disabled veteran deduction, for instance. That would be acceptable because it's not the same person claiming both deductions. So the same property could have both deductions on it. The same person, though, couldn't claim both deductions. Uh, the deduction can't be denied on the basis that the recipient is away from the property while in a hospital or a nursing home. Uh, and I, I think you could probably throw an assisted living facility. I think that would probably fit within that umbrella. And uh, now, this, this last bullet point, this might be where this idea is coming from, that this deduction can't zero out a, a tax bill. There's this, this narrow exception here where if, if any joint tenant or tenant in common is not at least 65, the deduction is reduced by a fraction. So again, let's say you've got Bob and Sue, husband and wife. Bob applies for the deduction. He's 65. Sue is only 62. 
In that case, I don't think there would be any fractional reduction because it's, it's a married couple uh, that we're talking about. But if, if Sue and her daughter own the property as tenants in common, and Sue is 65, but her daughter is uh, only uh, 40 years old, then there would be a fractional reduction. I think it would be a 50% reduction. Statute explains what the, the fraction is, and um, in that case, it would be a 50% reduction. All right, now, here's an example of, of where there is actually, there's an over 65 deduction and there's an over 65 credit. Uh, so this is one of those situations where terminology is important because uh, there, there is a deduction and a, a credit that, goes, that go by the same name. Uh, this credit prevents the recipient's homestead tax liability from increasing by more than 2% over the previous year. Uh, the applicant must have been eligible for the homestead deduction in the preceding year as well as the current year. And if the applicant filed an individual income tax return for the preceding year, his income can't have exceeded $30,000, or in the case of a joint filing, $40,000. Gross assessed a value of the homestead cannot, have, cannot exceed $160,000. And interestingly enough, there is no restriction on combining this credit with other deductions. So again, why this is the way it is, I don't know. It's confusing. It, it's not intuitive. It doesn't make any sense. But it's the way the statutes were written. So. If you have a, let's say you have a disabled veteran deduction, you can't also claim an over 65 deduction, but you could claim an over 65 credit. Again, I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's, that's the way it works. And once again, with this, uh, with this credit, uh, if someone wants it for 15, pay 16, they would need to be at least 65 by the end of 2015. Now, speaking of uh, uh, older folks, Upon seeing an elderly lady for the drafting of her will, the attorney charged her $100. She gave him a $100 bill, not noticing that it was stuck to another $100 bill. On seeing the two bills stuck together, the ethical question came to the attorney's mind. Do I tell my partner? Now keep in mind, the louder you laugh, the fewer of those kinds of jokes I'll tell. So. All right, the blind disabled person deduction. Now, this deduction is $12,480. Uh, the applicant must use the property as principal place of residence. The applicant must own or be buying the property under recorded contract. The applicant must provide proof of blindness or disability. And the applicant's individual income for the preceding year did not exceed $17,000. So in this case, let's say you have an applicant who files jointly with a spouse. I think in that case, the applicant will somehow have to be able to parse out their portion of that income. Now, this, this question came up recently, which I thought was rather interesting. I have a couple that both apply for the disabled deduction. This will take the value to zero on their primary residence. They have two other parcels. Can you put the rest of the disabled deduction on the other property they own? And again, this this deduction is applicable only to the person's principal residence. Now, when you, when you hear the term principal residence, you might think to homestead deduction. There is kind of a parallel there. But here's the difficulty. The homestead deduction statute is very specific that a homestead is the dwelling and the surrounding acre. That concept isn't literally in the blind disabled deduction statute. That statute just refers to the applicant's principal residence. So. I don't know that the, the blind disabled deduction would be limited to just the dwelling and the surrounding acre. I think arguably if somebody has a dwelling and let's say two acres that they use as their principal residence, for purposes of the homestead deduction, they would be limited to the dwelling and the surrounding acre. For purposes of the blind disabled deduction, I think a case could be made that this deduction could be applied to the dwelling in the two acres because the blind disabled deduction just says principal residence, it doesn't actually say homestead. So again, I know it makes no sense, it's confusing, uh, but again, I'm doing the best I can to try to reconcile these, uh, these ambiguities in, in the statute. All right, the Heritage Barn deduction. If I had a dollar for every call or email I've received about this, I could have bought a, a Heritage Barn. Uh, but this deduction is, is new. It was introduced last year, but it did not take effect until the 15 pay 16 cycle. This is for barns constructed before 1950 that retain sufficient integrity of design materials and construction to clearly identify the building as a barn that is not being used for agricultural purposes in the operation of an agricultural enterprise and is not being used for a business purpose. And also, for good measure, it cannot be used as a dwelling. So, uh, some common questions that have come up on this deduction. Uh, you know, can a, a person store equipment in the barn and still qualify? 
you know, and again, this is a very fact-sensitive case-by-case analysis. I mean, if you have somebody who's actively farming and they store their tractors in the barn, um, I think that would probably be a problem because the, the person is engaged in a business operation or an agricultural enterprise and is using the barn to house their equipment. I think that would be problematic. But if you have a retired farmer who's storing you know, some antique tractors in the barn, I don't think that would be an issue. I think this is really contemplating uh, you know, if somebody is actively farming or engaging in business and trying to use the barn to facilitate that business, that would be an issue. Uh, how many heritage barn deductions can a person receive? You know, my, my initial reaction was that a person would be limited to just one heritage barn deduction, but we looked at this question a little bit more closely and we believe that a person could receive more than one heritage barn. Uh, because the deduction is really corresponding to property as opposed to a person. So I, I think a person could claim more than one heritage barn deduction. Now, what about a barn that's been refurbished? That's another interesting question. You know, if, if the barn, if they've put some siding on it or they've painted it or put new windows in or something, it, you know, it, does it lose its eligibility? And, you know, again, it's a good question. I think so long as there's still enough of a core heritage barn there, I think it could probably still qualify. Um, this is kind of analogous to if somebody finds a 1931 Ford Model A in a junkyard somewhere, and all that's left is just the, the body of the car, and they, you know, they rebuild it, and you know, most of the parts are actually new. I think it's still titled as a 1931 Ford Model A. So I think if there's enough of a core heritage barn there, it could probably still qualify for the deduction. Now this question came up about uh, the assessor's office it says that they have to compile some list of heritage barn owners or something like that. I'm not exactly sure where that's coming from. The, the bill that gave rise to this deduction does refer to the Office of Tourism Development developing some uh, tourism materials about heritage barns, but I've not come across anything about compiling lists or anything like that, so I thought I would just throw that out there. All right, the disabled uh, veteran deductions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those uh, later in, in the presentation. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I could use another laugh right about now. Um, and I'm going to try this one out and see what reaction I get. It's a little bit subtle, but I thought it ties in nicely to what I was saying earlier about this presentation being about giving you information. So here it goes. So two women are on a transcontinental balloon voyage. Their craft is engulfed in fog. Their compass gone awry. Afraid of landing in the ocean, they drift for days. Suddenly the clouds part to show a sunlit meadow below. As they descend, they see a man walking his dog. One of the flyers yells out to the figure below, where are we? The man yells back about a half mile from town. Once again, the balloonists are engulfed in the mist. One flyer says to the other, he must have been a lawyer. The other says, a lawyer, how do you know that? The first says, that's easy. The information he gave was accurate, concise, and entirely irrelevant. <laughs> All right, well, Maybe I'll try it on the assessors in August and see what they think. All right, moving on to the next segment here. This is going to be some uh, FAQs and some other pointers that um, I think are, are pretty important. Um, first off, if a deduction is validly in place on the assessment date, it will stay in place for that assessment date, even if the property uh, changes hands later in the year. And, and this fact is not changing, even though the assessment date is moving from March 1st to January 1st next year for real property. So again, if, if I have a homestead deduction on my property on March 1st, 2015, and then a couple months later I sell the property to my cousin, that homestead will stay in place for 15th pay 16 because it was validly in place on the assessment date. And the second bullet point here, as you know, the, the general rule of thumb is that a person can have no more than one homestead deduction. There's a narrow exception to that, and in this case, if a person moves from one, from one homestead to another later that year, uh, they, can, they can claim the homestead on that first property, and they can also claim it on the new property for that assessment date. For the following assessment date, the homestead would fall off the old property. So again, it is possible under that narrow circumstance for someone to claim two homesteads in their name for one assessment date, and it's, it's simply because they've moved from one homestead to another after the assessment date. Question has come up in the past, you know, you have somebody who closes on a house on December 31st, but doesn't move in until the following February. Can they apply for the homestead deduction for that year? And again, this is, it's a good question, and it's a tough one to answer because statute does not really explicitly address this. What we have advised is that it, a person probably should use the property at least for a day uh, during the year for which they're applying for the deduction. So if you're closing on December 31st, 
um, if you can move in on December 31st and use it as your homestead for at least that day, you know, that, that'll count. But if you're not going to be moving in until the, the following year, that does seem to become a little bit more problematic. Now, I've touched on this, uh, this particular topic already, so for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over it. Uh, I've also talked about the first bullet point. That second one there is, is important, that for 14 pay 15 onward, for property to receive the 1% tax cap, it actually has to be receiving the homestead deduction. You might recall that there was a Board of Tax Review decision that applied to prior assessment dates uh, that said that property simply had to be eligible for the deduction to get the 1% cap. But now for 14 pay 15 onward, property actually has to be receiving uh, the deduction to get the 1% cap. Now, I know that a lot of you are still seeing grief counselors about uh, your post-traumatic stress uh, concerning the, the homestead verification program. So I don't want to reopen old wounds. I will simply say that as a reminder, if somebody comes in and provides proof of their eligibility uh, for a assessment date for which the deduction was terminated for failure to file the pink form, the deduction must be reinstated. Uh, there is no deadline or expiration point for that. And uh, the taxpayer can seek a refund, but there is no interest due. And there's no statutory obligation to file a, a Form 133. If the, if the taxpayer provides proof of eligibility, the deduction must be reinstated. I think Board of Accounts has suggested that you know, the county might want to fill out a form on its, on its own uh, just for bookkeeping or record keeping purposes, but the taxpayer technically isn't obligated to do so. Now, in terms of, of proof, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few slides, but an order may limit what evidence he or she requests to a state income tax return, a valid driver's license, or a valid voter registration card. There's technically no prohibition against requesting or looking at other types of, of documentation as the circumstances uh, uh, necessitate. And, and I, our, I think my suggestion would be if there's a dispute over someone's eligibility for a particular year to try to narrow the focus of, of the review of evidence to just that particular year. So if, if there's a dispute over 13 pay 14, instead of having the taxpayer bring in five years worth of income tax returns, try to narrow the, the scope of the review just to that particular year. And the next slide, this is something that's come up a little bit more recently and it touches on this, this question about you know, how much can a county do to try to police deductions or to kind of supplement state law in, in processing deductions? And certainly, you know, I appreciate that the counties want to, to be diligent and police these things and prevent fraud and duplicate homesteads and, and so forth. And so it's, it's a tough predicament to be in. I mean, we certainly, you know, want to encourage uh, diligence. On the other hand, you know, all of us, you know, the state agency, the, the local officials, we all only have the powers and authorities uh, that statute gives us. So I would caution you against implementing policies or procedures that are not supported in, in state law. So, you know, for instance, you know, if, if, you, if you're telling people, I'll only accept your homestead application if you actually attach a copy of your, your driver's license to it. I think that's probably going a little bit too far because statute does not require a person to attach a copy of their driver's license. They simply uh, have to provide la the last five digits of the driver's license number, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Or in some cases, uh, you know, somebody fills out the sales disclosure form and the auditor's office says that uh, before the end of the year you have to physically come in and show us your driver's license before we'll grant the, the deduction. I think that's also a bit problematic because in the sales disclosure statutes it says that if the person fills out the form correctly and accurately and supplies the information that is required, uh, the deduction shall be, be granted. So there is no additional step the person has to go through. Uh, and again, I understand why counties want to do it, and I understand that uh, you, know, you want to be diligent and prevent fraud, uh, but again, you know, there, are, there are just simply limitations in, in state law. Um, and the, the last point, bullet point there, just a little bit of free legal advice, you can't uh, require the submission of a complete social security number unless statute uh, allows you to do so. Now, um, this, this particular question came up uh, recently. And uh, if you have two unmarried individuals who both own a property and one of them uses it as his homestead, I mean, he's not precluded from applying for the homestead deduction even if his co-owner receives a homestead deduction on, a, on the property where she lives. So I give you this example. My good friends Bob and Sue are back. Uh, in this case, they're siblings and uh, they own house A, which Bob uses as his homestead. Bob can 
claim a homestead deduction on house A, even if Sue claims a homestead deduction on house B, which she uses as her homestead. Now, if you compare that, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to the legislative portion of the, the presentation, but let's say Bob and Sue uh, both used house A as their homestead. Um, under, under the law as it's been amended this session, only one of those two people could apply for the homestead deduction on that property. They couldn't both uh, apply for the homestead on House A, even if they both used House A as their homestead. So you've got to distinguish that situation from this situation in, in this example here, where Bob and Sue um, both own House A, but only Bob is using House A as his homestead. All right, now this, I've got a, a few slides on the topic of driver's licenses, and um, I was a little bit leery about how, how much I wanted to put in here, how far I wanted to, to delve into this topic, because it really is very difficult and, and complicated. So I'm going to touch on, on a couple slides. There are a few I think I'm going to skip over and, and, and let you take a look at on, on your own. You can certainly contact me with any questions that you have. But you know, the question of driver's licenses comes up rather, rather frequently. And I wanted to show you kind of how difficult it is for us to, to work through this as well. These two excerpts that you're looking at are coming from the exact same statute. This is the Homestead Deduction Statute. And the statute says that when somebody is applying for the Homestead Deduction, when they're filling out the form, uh, they have to provide the last five digits of their Social Security number. And if they don't have a Social Security number, then they can provide the last five digits of a driver's license number. Notice it just says driver's license number. It doesn't say valid driver's license number. It doesn't say Indiana driver's license number. If they don't have a driver's license number, they can provide the last five digits of a state identification number. And if they don't have any of those numbers, they can provide the last five digits of a control number issued by the U.S. federal government. Now, in the same statute, there's this provision, which says the county auditor may limit the evidence that an individual is required to submit to a state income tax return, a valid driver's license, or a valid voter registration card showing that the residence for which the deduction is claimed is the individual's principal place of residence. So now we have this term valid driver's license. I mean, how do we, how do we reconcile this, and how do we also take into to consideration the fact that you know, somebody who's filling out a sales disclosure form and applying for the deduction through that form Probably, I mean, it's possible they've just moved to, to Indiana. They don't have an Indiana driver's license yet. So, I mean, how do we kind of reconcile all of this? I think that the way I, what I would suggest or what I would tell you is that when someone is filling out the form, I think it is possible for them to use an out-of-state driver's license for, for purposes of populating the, the form and providing the information on the form. Now, if push comes to shove and the auditor receives their application and has some question or concern, and the auditor approaches that taxpayer and says, you know, I'm not quite sure about this. Can you show me a valid driver's license? I think that applicant would then potentially be in a little bit of a bind, because if they couldn't actually show you a, a valid driver's license showing uh, that the residence for which the deduction is claimed is the individual's principal place of residence, then their only other option might be to show you maybe a state income tax return or a voter registration card. So, again, I think that's maybe the best way I can reconcile this. For purposes of filling out the form, I think a person could use an out-of-state driver's license number, but then if push comes to shove and, they, and the auditor requests some uh, additional verification here pursuant to statute, then if they can't show you a valid driver's license showing the Indiana address, then they might have to, to show you a valid voter card or state income tax return, um, and, and that might be the, the situation that they're in. So again, that's kind of the best I can, I can offer you. I know it, it's, it's convoluted, but again, making, lemon, making lemonade out of lemons. Now, uh, the question that sometimes comes up, under state law, don't you have 60 days after becoming a resident to, be, to get your Indiana driver's license? And I think that is correct. But I don't think a person's failure to do so would disqualify them from seeking a homestead deduction because the homestead deduction, as we just said, as we just discussed, when you're applying for it, um, you, you theoretically could use an out-of-state driver's license on the form. Now, if you don't get your license in the 60 days, you know, maybe you could get a ticket from the police or something, but I don't think it has any bearing on your eligibility for the homestead deduction. Now, the next uh, couple slides, as I said, I'm going to kind of skip over because it gets really deep in the weeds, and I'll just kind of let you look at that on your, at your own pace. Uh, let's move on to a much lighter topic of divorce. Um, remember that unless a couple is legally divorced, the couple is still married and entitled to only one homestead deduction, and that's true even if the couple is, is living apart or is separated. 
Uh, if they're still legally married, they're just entitled to one homestead deduction. Now, there's a very narrow exception to this, and I've given you the excerpt here from the homestead deduction statute. And I'm not going to read it verbatim here, but, but basically, if you have uh, a spouse in Indiana and then another spouse in another state, and they maintain separate principal places of residence in their respective names only, uh, and the out-of-state uh, spouse is receiving a homestead deduction in that state, the Indiana spouse can theoretically claim a homestead deduction in Indiana. Uh, again, it's a very narrow exception. I don't know how often you'd really encounter it, uh, but again, I've documented you know, the procedures that the, uh, you know, the couple has to go through to get the, the homestead here in Indiana. Now, the second bullet point here on slide 32, um, question has come up, you know, when does someone have to refile for a deduction? And I think that the only two deductions that, that really come to mind where somebody would have to refile um, would be the homestead or mortgage are the two most obvious situations. And, and even then, usually if, if someone marries, they, would have to ref they, should, they should refile for the homestead deduction because now there's a spouse whose information should be picked up. Um, if, if they refinance their home, they should, they should refile the mortgage deduction because obviously now their, uh, their indebtedness has presumably changed. Um, this particular provision um, says that you know, in the event of a divorce, okay, um, if, the, if an individual who receives the deduction that is jointly owned with another owner in a particular year and remains eligible for the deduction the following year is not required to reapply for the deduction following the removal of the joint owner if the individual is awarded sole ownership of property in a divorce decree. That's quite a mouthful. Now, how exactly does this apply in the real world? And let's say you have on March 1st, uh, the couple is married, and the homestead deduction is in place, and then they get officially divorced a couple months later. Certainly there, nobody needs to refile the deduction for that preceding assessment date, because as I just said earlier, if the deduction is validly in place on the assessment date, it stays in place. Um, for, the, for the next assessment date, should, should the ex-wife, for instance, who let's say she gets ownership of the house, should she refile for the, the homestead deduction in her name? I think she probably should. I think that's the cleanest uh, approach. But then we have this provision here, and you know, could it be argued that for, the, that for the next assessment date she doesn't need to refile? Again, I mean, this is, this is just kind of am ambiguous and unhelpful law in my opinion. Um, I think it'd be my suggestion that she refile. I think that's cleanest. I think that's the best approach. But again, you know, should the, you know, does the deduction have to be terminated if she doesn't refile? And again, I think the answer is probably no. It can probably be left in place. But again, my suggestion would be that she refile um, so that your records are, are most up to date, especially if the ex-husband goes to buy a, a property and claim the homestead in his name. He might still be showing up in the database as married to uh, the ex-wife, and that could complicate things. Next slide here talk, touches a little bit on the, the idea of, of due diligence on the part of the auditor. I mean, how far does an auditor have to go uh, you know, before terminating a deduction. And this was a, a question I had received. Um, you know, the, the auditor receives a letter in December from a taxpayer saying that their address has changed and they'd like their mail forwarded to their new address. Uh, the auditor is wondering, do I pull the deduction? And, and I think in this particular case, we don't have enough information to act on because if the person moved after March 1st, as we know, the deduction would stay in place. If they moved prior to March 1st, then arguably the deduction should be pulled, but we just we simply don't know enough. We don't have enough information here to, to act on. And so I think in this particular scenario, the auditor would have two options. The auditor could either uh, err on the side of safety and just leave the deduction in place, or the auditor could try to follow up with the taxpayer and get a little bit more clarification on the chronology of events. Now, yes, it is true that under state law, the taxpayer is the one who has the obligation to notify you if they become ineligible for a deduction. That is true. In this case, though, we don't actually know if the person was ineligible. And so I think the auditor probably has some obligation to do some due diligence before terminating a deduction. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the income thresholds for the over 65 deduction and the blind disabled deduction. Now, this first uh, bullet point here, I've already uh, addressed this, this provision on an earlier slide. Um, but the over 65 deduction statute uh, does include the, the provision at the bottom of the slide here. In order to substantiate the deduction statement, the applicant shall submit for inspection by the county auditor a copy of the applicant's, a copy of the applicant's spouse's income tax returns for the preceding calendar year. 
If either was not required to file an income tax return, the applicant shall subscribe to that fact in the deduction statement. So this is one situation where somebody does have to uh, provide you with some additional documentation in order to qualify for this deduction. Now notice, statute simply says the applicant shall submit for inspection by the county auditor. There's no obligation that the taxpayer actually staple a copy of their income tax return and permanently submit it to you. I think a person could come to your window, bring their income tax return, show it to you, and you could look at it and maybe you know, make some uh, notation on the, the application or something or in your records to show that you've seen it, and then they could take it back with them. You know, some taxpayers obviously are going to be sensitive about surrendering that kind of personal information to you. So I think they could simply show it to you and take it back, but they do have to at least show it to you. And if, in fact, they don't have to file an income tax return, uh, then they have to, as statute says, subscribe to that fact on the uh, deduction statements. In other words, I think on the application form, they would simply write on there, uh, I, I'm not required to file an income tax return, presumably because their income is not uh, uh, significant enough to, to require one. And the next slide here is uh, the excerpt from the over 65 credit. Again, I've already read through that, so I'm not going to do that again here. But we can, we can sort of compare that to the blind disabled deduction provision here. And again, we're looking at the uh, individual's income. Now, the, the blind disabled deduction has this, this particular caveat. For purposes of this section, taxable gross income does not include income which is not taxed under the federal income tax laws. That particular caveat does not appear in the over 65 deduction. And once again, it'd be great if these were a little bit more uniform or consistent. I think that looking at the blind disabled deduction and the over 65 deduction and credit, I think our agency has advised that in both cases you would look at the adjusted gross income and that only income subject to federal income taxation would count toward that threshold. So in some cases I know, you know certain social security is not subject to federal income taxation if I'm not mistaken. So again, I think this is kind of the way our agency has tried to reconcile these provisions and advise counties. Now, um, another very important point here is that only the over 65 deduction uh, or credit statute requires the submission of an income tax return. So the blind disabled deduction statute does not require the applicant to show you a copy of their income tax return. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, well, Mike, how in the world am I supposed to verify that their income doesn't exceed that threshold? And that's a very good question. I think if you wanted to ask if they would be willing to show you a copy of their income tax return, that would probably be okay. But if they refuse to do so, you cannot refuse or deny their deduction simply for that reason, because statute doesn't require them to show you uh, their income tax return. So I think your, your option would be to rely in good faith on their representation, keeping in mind they're signing under penalties of perjury, um, or if you have a, a truly legitimate concrete belief in good faith that they're not eligible, um, you could deny the application and then, of course, they could go through the appeals process. Now, trusts, trusts that own property can have certain deductions, and I've highlighted those here. Uh, basically, the person with the beneficial interest in the trust would be the one to apply for the deduction. And this was an interesting question that came up recently from a county. Can our county collect on ineligible deductions other than the homestead deduction? And uh, our agency looked at this, and, and the only statutory mechanism uh, for collecting on an ineligible deduction is for the homestead deduction. There is no statutory mechanism for collecting on other ineligible deductions. In other words, if somebody had a, a mortgage deduction for a few years to which they weren't entitled, there's no statutory mechanism for going and trying to collect on that. Um, however, we think that you, you could potentially pursue the taxpayer in court. I mean, you could probably take them to court and try to collect on those, those taxes from the, the taxpayer through court, but there's no statutory mechanism to do that. Sometimes the question comes up, you know, when, you know, do I ever have to notify somebody that I am denying or terminating their deduction? The two situations that come to mind, uh, one is, is with the Homestead Verification Program. Before you terminate someone's deduction for failure to file the pink form, you do have to notify them ahead of time. The other situation is, is here. If somebody submits a Homestead Deduction application to you and you determine that they're not eligible, you do have to notify them of their appeal rights. So I think those are the only two situations that come to mind where you do have to notify a taxpayer uh, that you're denying or terminating a deduction of theirs. Speaking of the uh, ineligible homestead deduction uh, statute, this is the, the statute, or at least a part of it. 
And I've highlighted a couple provisions here for you. Uh, the first is if, if you make a determination that property uh, was, was not eligible for the deduction for a particular year, you have to do one of two things, and this was implemented in, into the code last year. Uh, you have to make a notation on the tax duplicate that the property is ineligible and then indicate the date the notation is made and or record a notice of an ineligible homestead lien. And the purpose behind this really is to put subsequent buyers of the property on notice that there is not going to be a deduction in place for the property. So when, the, when a new buyer comes along and they do the title search, hopefully the title company will pick up on this fact and the buyer will realize, okay, I'm, I'm not going to get the carryover for this property if I buy it. So I think that's the, the purpose behind this, this obligation on the auditor. The other thing I want to point out here is that when you issue the notice of the, the taxes due on that ineligible homestead deduction, uh, the notice goes to the owner that, re, that improperly received the deduction. So again, this, this I think is to protect subsequent buyers of the property. So if, you know, if Joe sells to, to Bob and it was Joe that received the deduction in his name improperly, then the notice is sent to Joe, not Bob. All right, veterans deductions. Once again, I, I really need a laugh here. That's, that's just too much heavy material here. Um, so let, let, me, let me try this one and, and see if it uh, does any better. Um, a barber gave a haircut to a priest one day. The priest tried to pay for the haircut, but the barber refused, saying, you do God's work. The next morning, the barber found a dozen Bibles at, his, at the door to his shop. A policeman came to the barber for a haircut, and again, the barber refused to pay, saying, you protect the public. The next morning, the barber found a dozen donuts at the door to his shop. A lawyer came to the barber for a haircut, and again the barber refused payment, saying, you serve the justice system. The next morning the barber found a dozen lawyers waiting for a free haircut. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll, I'll use that one again, that got a better reaction, all right. Now the, the code system, um, my understanding is the Department of Veterans Affairs has discontinued the use of the codes. Uh, my understanding is the codes were really just about, about classifying vets uh, according to disability. The disabled vet deduction statutes never actually made use of or, or referred to these codes. Uh, so sometimes I, I think this kind of muddied the waters a bit. I just thought I would put that out there for you. There are really two primary disabled vet deductions. Uh, one is for vets who are partially disabled. And uh, this deduction is worth $24,960. And this, this deduction is for vets who served during wartime and have a service-connected disability of at least 10 percent. Now, we skip ahead a couple of slides and compare that to uh, the other primary disabled vet deduction, which is for vets who are totally disabled or who are at least 62 with a disability of at least 10 percent. This deduction is worth $12,480, and in this case, the vet did not have to serve during wartime. He could have served during peacetime, and he does not have to have a service-connected disability. All right, so again, if he has a disability, a total disability, or if he's, if he's at least 62 with a disability of at least 10 percent, does not need to be service-connected, he could potentially qualify for the totally disabled vet deduction. Now, in both cases, the vet does have to provide proof of his disability and his honorable discharge and so forth. But one other very important distinction between these two deductions is that the totally disabled vet deduction has an assessed value threshold of $143,160. And you do have to consider all of the vet's property. It's not just the property where he resides, it's all of his tangible property. A question had come up, you know, what about if a vet owns a house in Florida? Do we take that into account? And I would say no, because the statute refers to tangible property as shown by the tax duplicate. So I think obviously only Indiana property is going to show up on an Indiana tax duplicate. So again, I think you would look at all of his Indiana property, uh, both real and, and personal property. Now th there was some legislation proposed this session that would have either eliminated this cap or, or raised it, but it did not gain traction for whatever odd reason. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides. I've got a, a couple of slides that just address the application process. I'm going to move on to this slide that talks about surviving spouses. A surviving spouse can claim the disabled vet deduction. Uh, basically, she would have to, to provide the same kind of documentation that her 
uh, her veteran spouse would have had to provide uh, if, if he were to apply for the deduction. And the surviving spouse can claim this deduction on property even if the property was not owned by the vet or the surviving spouse at the time of the veteran's death. And the other thing is, too, that the surviving spouse can claim this, this deduction even if she remarries. All right, now this is the last year I'll be able to, to use my, my joke concerning the World War I veteran deduction. You know, as I say, if someone comes into your office claiming to be a World War I veteran, don't call me, call the Ghostbusters. Um, and, and the reason I can't use that joke any longer is because um, starting January 1st, 2016, this deduction is, is off the books. It is being discontinued for obvious reasons. And I'll touch on that again uh, as we get to the legislative portion of the presentation. All right, now, oh, let's talk about excise taxes. Uh, bear, bear with me here. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, it is possible for a vet um, who, uh, who has a disabled vet property tax deduction to apply an unused portion of that deduction toward his excise taxes. Uh, these are the taxes that he, applies, that he pays on a vehicle at, at the BMV. Now, there are, there are two paths that a vet can go down uh, in, in getting this excise tax credit. The first path is for vets who qualify for the, the property tax deduction and have an unused portion remaining after the deduction is applied to their property. In that case, the vet would come to you as the auditor and you would fill out, I think it's the 128 VET form. I think it's the same form and process you've been using for a number of years. You would calculate the amount of credit that the vet gets and then the vet would take that form to the BMV and get his credit. So that's, there's nothing new there. That's just the way it's been for many, many years. There's another path a vet could go down, and this is a path for a vet who does not own or is not buying property that qualifies for a disabled vet property tax deduction. So this would cover a situation where, let's say, the vet is simply renting an apartment. Or let's say the vet uh, is, is totally disabled, but it's not a service-connected disability, and his house is worth a million dollars. So he doesn't qualify for a disabled vet property tax deduction uh, because his assessed value is too high for one of them and because he doesn't have a service-connected disability for the other one. So in, in both of those cases, the vet who's, for instance, renting an apartment or the vet whose house is a million dollars and he, has only a, he, has, he doesn't have a service-connected disability, that vet can go to the auditor's office and receive an affidavit from the auditor where the auditor affirms that that vet does not own or is not buying property that qualifies for a disabled vet property tax deduction. The vet takes that affidavit to the BMV and fills out one of their forms and he can get a credit, uh, it's the lesser of $70 or the excise tax due, uh, whichever, whichever is less, uh, and a maximum of two vehicles. So theoretically, potentially $140 of, of credit. So again, those are the, the two paths that, that a vet could, could potentially take depending on his circumstances. Now, our, our agency prescribed a sample or template affidavit that you're welcome to use. It's on our website. Uh, you don't have to use this. If you want to draft one in consultation with your county attorney, that would be fine. Uh, but yes, the affidavit does have to be notarized. I think that's kind of the, the purpose of, of an affidavit, is having it notarized. So you may have to run it down to the county clerk or hopefully somebody at your government center who is a notary public and have them uh, notarize it. All right. This question came up recently, which I thought was very interesting, and again, um, kind of one of those, those gaps or chasms in, in Indiana code that, you know, there, there's really nothing in code that addresses this particular nuance uh, or, or set of circumstances. But let's say disabled vet Bob owned a property on March 1st, 2014, and received the disabled vet deduction for that assessment date, and then sold the property later in 2014 and began renting an apartment. Uh, now, when, when the tax bill comes due in, in 2015 in spring, can Bob still claim his excise credit on that unused portion? And I think the answer would be yes, I think he could. Now, um, what happens if there is no unused portion remaining? Can he claim, can he request the affidavit and get the excise only credit? And this is a very interesting question because normally a vet could not double dip. If a vet qualified for the, partial, for the disabled vet deduction and the entire amount was used up on the property, he couldn't turn around and claim uh, the, the excise only credit. He couldn't double dip that way. But what's different here, what's unique here is that Bob no longer owns property. He's just renting an apartment. So I think a case could be made that he probably could request the affidavit. Again, normally that would be double dipping, but I, again, I think because he's, he's just renting, he no longer owns property, 
I think he could request the affidavit and get the excise only credit. Again, I'm trying to do my best reconciling these and making sense of this and trying to resolve it in favor of the disabled veteran if, if at all possible. Now, can a vet receive more than one disabled vet deduction? The vet could receive no more than one of each deduction. So it is possible for a vet to qualify for both a partially disabled and a totally disabled vet deduction. Because if you think about it, a vet could have a, a total disability that's service connected. So he could qualify for both of those deductions, but he couldn't claim more than one of each deduction. He could theoretically split a deduction between two properties if he wanted to. Now, what if two vets own a property? And once again, I think that each vet could claim no more than one of each of, of the deductions, but I think both vets could claim, claim the deductions. It's, it's not like a, a homestead deduction where a married couple you know, is limited to just one homestead. And also, if a vet owns only personal property, so if, if he, let's say he rents an apartment, but he owns a business and he has some depreciable personal property, some business tools, he could claim the deduction on that uh, personal property. All right, deductions on mobile homes. Um, I've presented on this material before, but um, I think it's worth bringing up again. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, there is an exception to the, the normal rule that uh, deductions could theoretically zero out a tax bill. In the case of personal property mobile homes, there is a statute, which I've cited here, that caps that uh, reduction at 50%, notwithstanding the, the supplemental homestead deduction. That one can, can pull it down uh, below that 50% cap. Difficulty sort of comes in, in play when, you, when you've got the homestead deduction, which, as I said, is the lesser of $45,000 or 60% of the assessed value of the property. So you know, how do you give someone their full homestead deduction uh, but then still abide by that 50% cap? And again, um, for the sake of, of time here, I'm going to skip to slide 65. Uh, we've, we've tried to provide a little bit of a, a, a chart here or guide for you. Now, keep in mind, this assumes that the person who owns the personal property mobile home also owns the land that it sits on. Um, in that case, the person could basically apply whatever deductions they, they can apply to the, to the mobile home to the land and, and zero out the, the uh, assessed value on the land. In a, in a case where the person does not own the land, they just own the, the mobile home, yeah, I mean, there, there comes a point where they're just going to be out of luck. They're not going to be able to get the, the full amount of their deductions because they've hit that 50% cap, and again, they're just sort of out of luck. Uh, this, this question, you know, if, if our vendor software set up that all of the vet's deduction, if, if all of the vet's deduction can't be applied to the mobile home, we apply all of it toward excise taxes. Again, if, if you can apply even a, a portion of a deduction to the mobile home before it hits that 50% cap, that's what you should do. All right, now, let's talk about some legislative changes. Now, thankfully, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of action on legislative changes um, this session. Uh, there were a few things worth noting. Uh, first, uh, House and Roll Act 1283. Uh, this uh, uh, bill introduced a provision here that says if a, a, for a property being purchased under a recorded contract to be considered a homestead, the contract must obligate the owner to convey title to the individual upon completion of all the individual's contract obligations. Now, this amendment was effective April 15th of this year, but it did not apply retroactively. So I, I think that existing contracts are grandfathered in. So you know, don't, don't feel that you have to run to your recorder's office and, and flip through 10,000 contracts to look for this provision. Um, I think those contracts can be left alone. But going forward, uh, this, this provision does have to be there. And I think this was intended to address a situation where you know, a landlord who's in reality simply leasing a property to somebody um, you know, kind of creates this this purchase contracts that the buyer could claim a homestead deduction and, and save the landlord a few bucks. And I think this provision was meant to, to address that. And now, if it really is a purchase contract, then the contract has to obligate the owner to convey title to the, to the buyer at the close of the contract. Senate Rule Act 372, I, I touched on this earlier. Uh, that uh, starting next year, if more than one individual or entity qualifies property as a homestead for an assessment date, only one homestead deduction can be applied to that property. So again, if you've got you know, Bob and Joe as siblings, they both own House A, uh, and they both use it as their homestead, only one of them can uh, claim the homestead deduction on that property. Senate Rule Act 441, that's the one that gets rid of the World War I vet deduction starting uh, in 2016. 1388, uh, this 
this gets back to, as you'll recall, I, I explained that if someone moves from their homestead after the assessment date to a new homestead uh, later that year, they can theoretically have the homestead deduction on both properties. Previously under the law, there was this kind of narrow, weird exception that was, that was on the books that if the property you were moving to was vacant land or a partially completed dwelling on the assessment date, that you could still claim the homestead on that property, but the homestead on the property you, you were moving from had to be canceled. So it was an exception to the exception to the rules. So 1388 clarifies that and eliminates the exception to the exception. And again, the universal policy, the universal uh, practice here is that if you're moving from one homestead to another after the assessment date, uh, you can claim the homestead on that new property and also have it on the old one for that same assessment date. Uh, 1388 also introduces an exemption for common areas, not a deduction, but an exemption. This is probably more targeted to assessors, but I thought I'd throw it in there anyway. And then 436 introduces an exemption for certain basements in special flood hazard areas. Tenant Rule Act 436, I think uh, you'll get a kick out of this one here, uh, introduces a property tax disclosure form. Now, please do not confuse this with the sales disclosure form. It's completely different, not the same thing. This is a property tax disclosure form. And, and how this works is the, the county uh, has the option of adopting an ordinance that allows the county or a unit or agency in the county uh, to require a person who is applying for a particular benefit or license to complete a property tax disclosure form. And this form basically documents whether the applicant is delinquent in any property tax. And now, I know you're, you're thinking, oh, well, does this mean if someone is delinquent in property tax, I can deny their application for a, a deduction or an exemption? And the answer is no. Statute does not uh, go so far as to, to grant that authority. Uh, and you might be asking, well, you know, well, why? What, what good or what purpose does this, you know, what does this form do then? Well, I'll be honest with you. My understanding is that the General Assembly actually intended for this provision to be removed from the bill before they voted on it, but because of an oversight, it was left in place. Um, so that's why it's, it's always a good practice not to rely too heavily on legislative intent, uh, because in this case, um, obviously, the intent, I think, was to remove it, but it was left in anyway. So at the very least, you know, this form may provide some transparency and it may perhaps guilt the person into paying their taxes before, you know, very publicly going to seek a, a zoning variance or something like that. So I mean, there, there might be some value as a tool for transparency or uh, accountability. I, I will add, and I, I conferred with State Board of Accounts about this, um, you know, th there might be a situation where there's a, a local home rule controlled benefit that perhaps you could deny or withhold if someone is delinquent on their property tax according to their, their tax disclosure form. So for instance, you know, I suppose if a city had like a, a citizen of the year award and they accepted nominations and somebody was nominated and before the city you know, bestowed the key to the city on that person, if the city asked that person to fill out the tax disclosure form and found out that they were delinquent, and maybe the city could, could withhold that uh, award on the, from that person because they're delinquent. Uh, that, I think, would, would be okay because that's not a state-governed or state-controlled benefit. Uh, but you know, when it comes to deductions, exemptions, uh, maybe certain licenses or, or, or building permits, I, I don't know to what extent some of that is locally controlled. Certainly the deductions and exemptions are controlled by state law. So uh, just, just be wary about that because I know I'll get a lot of questions about that. Now, Senate Rule Act 420, uh, this is actually from 2014, but I'm putting it in here as a reminder that starting next year, uh, exemptions will be handled a little bit differently than they have been up to this point. Through 2015, if uh, property that is receiving exemption changes ownership or use after the assessment date so that it, it's no longer eligible for an exemption, the exemption is removed for that preceding assessment date. So in other words, you know, if, if a church is receiving an exemption on a building on March 1st, 2015, and then sells the building to a business in June of 2015, the exemption for 15 pay 16 would be removed. Starting next year, if the exemption is validly in place on the assessment date, January 1st, it will remain in place even if the property's use or ownership changes hands. So in other words, an exemption will be handled very similarly to a deduction. So if on January 1st the church owns a building and then sells the building to a business in March of 2016, that exemption will stay in place for 16 pay 17 even though there's been a change in ownership. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about sales disclosure form issues. Now, last um, year, our agency began the process of looking at revisions to the sales disclosure form. Uh, we have not released a revised sales disclosure form, and it, it, it might come out later this year. It could be next year. We're not 100 percent sure. There are some other hurdles we have to, to jump through. Uh, but we, we at least began the process of exploring changes to the form. And so we reached out to a few different entities and, and solicited feedback. And one of the most common complaints that I, I received was that there is this radical inconsistency among the counties in the way that these forms are, are processed and handled. And I, I wanted to provide this excerpt from statute. And it says, county assessing officials, county auditors, and other local officials may not establish procedures or requirements concerning sales disclosure forms that substantially differ from the procedures and requirements of this chapter. So I think state law does contemplate that there could be some degree of variation among counties, uh, but there can't be a substantial departure from state law. So I think that's very important. One of the questions that's come up by both counties and taxpayers is, you know, can, can a county make every person recording a deed file a sales disclosure form? And the answer is a resounding no, that the sales disclosure form is only required under certain circumstances. And again, statute explains, you know, if we're talking about transfer of real property for valuable consideration or if there is a, a conveyance document that corresponds to uh, a compulsory transaction, you know, under those circumstances, the sales disclosure form would be necessary. But there could be a, a thousand different reasons somebody records a deed or some other document that would not necessitate a sales disclosure form. Now, I understand that some counties want to have some kind of you know, you know, bookkeeping or, or you know, a track record or something uh, as you communicate between offices. So the question is, you know, could a county prescribe its own form and use its own form? And I think you know, that, that might be possible. I think you could probably work with your local council and, and draft up something. Uh, but I, I would discourage you from making it as onerous and, and complex as the sales disclosure form. Um, and, and also, please don't take our sales disclosure form and just take the state seal off of it and change the title and, and pass it off as your form. Um, you can't do that with the state form. Um, so if, if you want to create your own from scratch, again, work with your county attorney and, and maybe uh, explore that. And keep in mind, only the sales disclosure form can be used for trending or ratio study purposes. So if you do create your own you know, uh, track record form or something, don't use that for trending. Uh, well, I guess this is more directed to the assessor, but the assessor shouldn't be using it for trending purposes. Now, these were some uh, claims that were, were raised by the Indiana Land and Title Association. And again, I, I kind of take some of these with a, a little bit of a grain of salt because, you know, this is probably you know, coming from, you know, one person tells something to someone else and it kind of goes through the chain there. So, but, you know, some, some allegations made, you know, concerned, again, the county is requiring everybody to file a sales disclosure form. Uh, we, we talked about that already. Some counties require sales disclosure forms on easements. Um, only, only certain kinds of easements require sales disclosure forms. So, you know, if, if a city has an easement on someone's land because they have to access a, a sewer, for instance, that would not require a sales disclosure form. But if I buy, you know, a, a right-of-way from my neighbor so I can access my landlocked garage, that would require a, a sales disclosure form because there is a transfer of real property for valuable consideration. Um, another, another issue here about counties require this, the, the form and fee in the case of divorce, and some do not. And under statute, if you have a document for a compulsory transaction involving divorce, the form is required, but there is no fee. Now, here, here are a couple of examples where there could be some variation among counties. So some counties require handwritten forms, and some require computer electronic submission. Some will only take black ink, you know, others will not. Um, statute doesn't really get into this level of detail, and I think this is fairly trivial. So, you know, have at it if you want to take blue ink or pink ink or green ink, you know, uh, go wild. Uh, that, I think, is fine. I think there can be some variation there uh, because statute doesn't really dictate things of, of that particular nature. Now, when it comes to signatures, uh, keep in mind that the, the signature of only one buyer and one seller is required. If you have a situation where you have a married couple and uh, they're applying, or, or let's say you've got a married couple and one of the spouses is buying a piece of property and applying for the homestead deduction, um, th that that spouse's uh, information, uh, you know, let's say Bob is, is the, the husband who's applying for the homestead through the sales disclosure form, he's buying a piece of property. 
he will have to include his wife's identification information on the form, even if she is not going to be on the deed to the property, even if she's not a buyer, if, you know, even if she's not involved. She, he, he still has to include her identification information on the form, but only Bob would actually have to sign. Again, only the signature of one buyer and one seller is required. Now, we, we've talked a little bit about identification information uh, for the homestead deduction. As I said earlier, statute says technically the last five of the social security number, if you don't have a social security number, the last five of the driver's license or the last five of the ID or, or uh, federal control number can be used. Now, I think that both the, the homestead application form and the sales disclosure form capture both sets of digits, the, the last five of the social and the last five of the driver's license. Again, technically under statute, the last five of the social is what's required. Um, as we look to revise forms down the road, we might think about revisiting that requirement, you know, capturing both sets of digits. I've, I've also talked with Matt Parkinson about this. I know a lot of county auditors are very concerned about homestead database compliance issues, and there's you know, fear about, you know, we're going to get penalized or we're going to get dinged or something if we're missing a piece of information. Um, but and, and I don't know if Matt talked about this earlier, but um, I wouldn't be as, as alarmed about that. I mean, the Homestead Database is, is meant to be a tool that auditors use to kind of cross-check applicants. It's not, it's not meant to be a, a, a mechanism for penalizing auditors or saying, oh, gotcha, you know, you, you missed this piece of information. So again, I, I think just, just keep that in mind that, you know, the, the goal is to try to document as much as possible uh, for purpose of cross-checking people, making sure they're not getting duplicate homesteads, but don't you know, don't be concerned about some penalty uh, from the Homestead database. We're not going to take away your budgets or anything like that. Um, and and this, this particular allegation, I'm hoping this isn't true because it, it would be rather alarming if it was, but uh, somebody had claimed that, that uh, counties don't allow any deductions to be filed through the sales disclosure form. And, and obviously that's not correct. The, the form can be used under state law to apply for certain deductions, including the Homestead. And as I said, you know, the, the form can be used to apply, and if, if the form is validly completed, the auditor must allow the deduction, and that's coming from statutes. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, this last slide, I'm, well, yeah, I guess, well, second to last slide, I'm not exactly sure what this uh, uh, allegation is, is referring to. You know, the, the pink form, that program has ended. Nobody should still be filling out pink forms. Um, and the pink form and the sales disclosure form are, are about two very different things. I mean, the sales disclosure form allows you to apply for the deduction, the, the, kind of your initial application for the deduction. The pink form was about verifying the deduction you're already receiving. So they were, they were different forms, serve different purposes. So I'm not exactly sure what this allegation is about, but I thought I would just throw it out there for you. And uh, you know, the form is primarily a tool used by assessors to do trending and ratio studies and, and to capture sales data for property. But again, it, it can be used to apply for certain deductions. All right, and uh, this particular slide, um, I thought I'd, I'd throw this out there for you. Last year, the, the phrase that you see in red was added to the code. And then this year, they took that phrase out of the code. And apparently, I don't know if it was at the request of the Auditors Association or, or what, but I guess there was some belief among the General Assembly that this language wasn't needed or that it wasn't really accurate or applicable or something. I really have no opinion on it. I thought I would just you know, show that to you uh, and just make you aware of that. All right. This is my contact information. Um, if you have questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I know that uh, usually after the conference, Debbie or Tammy um, offer us the gift of a stack of questions uh, from you guys, and that's fine. Um, you know, before you submit a question, you know, certainly feel free to double check my presentation to see if your question is answered there. Uh, it would save us some time at the office from you know, retyping all the questions. Uh, but you know, again, you know, feel free to, to submit a question or, or email me. And uh, I think I ended up a little bit earlier than I thought, so I think I have time for one last joke to kind of wrap things up here. So we have an independent woman started her own business. She was shrewd and diligent, so business kept coming in. Pretty soon she realized she needed an in-house counsel, and so she began interviewing young lawyers. As I'm sure you can understand, she started off with one of the first applicants. In a business like this, our personal integrity must be beyond question. She leaned forward. Mr. Peterson, are you an honest lawyer? Honest, replied the job prospect. Let me tell you something about honest. Well, I'm so honest that my dad lent me $15,000 for my education and I paid back every penny the minute I tried my first case. Impressive. And what sort of case was that? He scrubbed in his seat and admitted, my dad sued me for the money. <laughs>
Um, all right, well, anyhow, um, thanks for your time. I appreciate it, and I hope that was helpful to you. And uh, again, I appreciate your time.